Hey beauties, welcome back to Real Girl Talk Podcast Radio. I am your host, Sherry Ricard. I'm a medical professional, business leader, author, speaker, and adversity recovery expert, bringing you fascinating guests, business, beauty, and lifestyle tips to help you create a beautiful life and always committed to keeping it real. Now let's dive in. Welcome back to Real Girl Talk. I am your host, Sherry, and I have a beautiful guest with me today, Kanisha Griffin. She is the author of six inspirational books. She has written both fiction and nonfiction books that promote messages of family togetherness and hope after trauma. Messages of hope and advocating for trauma survivors are at the core of everything that she writes. Kanisha has been featured in multiple media outlets and magazines, and she is with us here today to talk about her story. I heard you tell your story a few times. Um, I was privileged to see a television show where you talked about your story, and one thing that you and I have in common is that we have both suffered a loss of a child. You have been through um, multiple miscarriages, which is I can only imagine that the trauma and I say, I can only imagine because no one that has walked in your shoes um, knows how you feel. They can only imagine. No one knows what it's like to lose a 17 year old son unless they've walked in my shoes. Right. We can only imagine. We don't want to imagine, but in actuality, I think one of the things that you can share is not just your story, but your story also and how it can help other women be able to care for and nurture their friends, their sisters, their coworkers that have been through some of the things that you have been through. And then I want to talk a little bit about your book, Put Your Pen to Paper, and why you wrote that. So let's start with a little bit about your story and what brought you to start writing inspirational books. Well, first, I was yes. super honored to be here. So thank you for the opportunity, Mr. I love your show. So it's a blessing to be here to talk to you. I have um, suffered with five miscarriages. I've, I'm blessed in that I was able to birth six children. But I was talking to my mom the other day and just talking about pregnancies and everything. And I said, Mom, you, you realize I've had 11 pregnancies. It's always interesting when I go to the doctor and they you know, ask you your history, and then you have to tell them, you know, or remind them how many pregnancies you've had, and so on and so forth, and I said, 11, and that's always a big number to nurses, and, and they're like, whoa, wow, you must have quite the story. My firstborn actually just made 13 yesterday. Um, oh. Before him, I had two miscarriages, and um, both were early. I think one was, I was about six weeks along with the first and then with the second about 10 weeks along and so they were both very devastating the very first one I remember not seeing a heartbeat I don't think at all I think we had a positive pregnancy test so I went in we saw the baby on the monitor but then there was no heartbeat there and so mm. we checked again to see if anything would happen like a few days later and there was nothing so then I had to um just kind of natural deliver you know the baby that way the second time there was a heartbeat in the beginning and i was hopeful and praying and begging and you know god please you know we see a heartbeat just make it stronger the heartbeat wasn't really that strong so my doctor was like he believes in miracles but let's see what happens because of course i'm sure he's seen plenty of a little heartbeat and then ultimately the baby deceased. And so, yes, that, that is what ended up happening. That's when I had to have my very first surgery um, since we were a little bit further along. When that happened, I noticed I wasn't the only one that was going through this thing. I noticed I had friends, like maybe months later, a friend would have a miscarriage. And then the next year, another friend would have. And with my doctor, we, we went through a lot of tests to find out. I'm, I'm grateful that he was aggressive and wanting to research what was really physically going on. Because to him, it just didn't make any sense why a healthy 20 something year old is having, you know, suddenly having, you know, miscarriages and multiple. He's concerned that, okay, 
this could happen again. So let's get to the bottom of this, try to figure out what's going on. And that was devastating. And he was wonderful. And we're still good friends to this day. And then he walked through this, this, this process with me and my family back then. Um, but we learned that I had a disorder called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is a blood clotting disorder. So what it looked like is every time I get pregnant, I would develop a blood clot somewhere in my uterus, which would attack the unborn baby, and then I would have the miscarriage. So mm. what we decided we would try was um, low dose of uh, heparin, which is often used for blood clots. Yeah. Um, I would use that. So I would give myself these shots in my stomach every day, and I would do that the entire pregnancy. So it worked with my oldest son. And then with the other kids, you know, that I had as well, I did suffer with some miscarriages in between three more. Wow. One was a second trimester loss, which I mean, they're all equally devastating, but that one was when I thought I passed that hard spot. You know, I thought, okay, I got past the first semester, yeah. first trimester. I'm good to go easy breezy through the rest of the pregnancy, but nope, I had sudden clotting happened. Uh, maybe 14, 15 weeks um, when I was feeling kicks and everything. And that one was just devastating. Uh. So loss uh, is different. I know for everyone, I know some people that have had miscarriages that have not expressed their um, grief certain ways too. They seem like, okay, it happened and I just moved on. But with many, 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 there's women silently suffer with it and carry it and silently carry that hurt for a long, long time and not sure how to walk through that. And then just like you said, there are people that have had family members or friends that have gone through it and they don't know how to comfort them. Right. So they're trying to figure out how to comfort them. So that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, Once Upon a Child. I decided to share my personal story with hopes that it would help moms give themselves grace through that grieving process because we usually don't give ourselves grace with a lot of things. <laughs> and right. even with our pain and suffering, you know, people expect moms to be superheroes, bounce back fast, get back to normal, you know, but it's hard. Those things. Right. Are right. And I know I, you and I were talking before the show and too, there are so many times that we want to help. We want to be able to say the right things. And I was telling you how I had wrote a blog years ago about the things never to say to a grieving mom. And I'm sure you could probably write your own list of those things never to say to someone that has had multiple miscarriages or even one, even one right. miscarriage, mm -hmm. you know, so help us with that. So I've never had a miscarriage. I, I lost a child when he was 17. And so I can tell, I can, I can speak to that from uh, experience as well as education because I went back to school and, and became certified in, in grief and adversity recovery because I wanted to speak from an educational standpoint, not just from experience. What are some things that we can do? So you say it's our sister, our coworker, our friend that has had a miscarriage. What are some things that we can do to support and what are things that you suggest that we stay away from? Good question. So I think when it comes to supporting, it's it's just letting your friend, your family member know that you're there for them. I think that was one of the things that helped me out the most because I had people sort of think, I don't really know how to be there for you, so I'm not going to say anything. Or mm -hmm. I just, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I don't really know, you know. So then I would encourage them. It's okay. It's okay to ask, to ask me if I'm okay. You know, my answer may be no. You know, it's okay to be honest. Like we should have that group of people that we can be honest, like brutally honest with, with how we feel, how we think. Those are the people we trust, right? Our inner circle of friends. And sometimes my answer is no, I'm not okay. You know, I'm hurting, you know, I still have moments and, and, and like you had said before, you know, like someone, oh, you have, you know, two other kids. I've had people say, oh, you have six. So maybe, you know, no, I have, I remember when all of these children should have been born and um, it hurts, you know, it's still, it's not a pain that just 
goes away, right? You right. remember there are things that trigger your memory and then you, and you have those moments where you still process that. So it's okay to be honest. I would say to the woman who, who may have experienced in this hair, just okay, be honest with those people you trust and tell them the truth about how you feel you're hurting right now. Right. And then let your friends be there for you. But I would say to the friends, let them on their timing come to you, you know, and be there for them. Sometimes just sitting with a friend. We don't even have to talk about it. We don't even have to get into details. Sometimes right. I see the shoulder or yeah. I saw a movie. Oh, this will make me cry. I saw a movie just the other day that just made me weep. Just looking at the beauty of friendship in that you can sit next to a person and just hold their hand and you don't even have to say anything, but just the presence of a person that loves you and you know, they're with you. They know you're hurting, you know, but they're sitting there just to be there for you. Sometimes that's enough. That like tells me everything without saying anything, you know? Right. right. <laughs> no, no you're absolutely right. And, and you, you hit something right there with me when you said not to ignore it, you know, yes. people that ignore what has happened to you because they don't know what to say. To me, that was one of the worst things. It, you not acknowledging me as a grieved mom, but not acknowledging my son that passed away. <laughs> and, and I can understand those that are hurting and, and knew uh, Bryant, but not to acknowledge, I'm his mother, right? So I'm his mother. There's something that you can say, not necessarily even do, like you said, just acknowledge the fact that, listen, I'm here. Um, and a lot of times we don't know what to do, right? We have mm -hmm. no idea. And, and I always tell people, don't always just say, hey, what can I do? But just take action mm -hmm. on something. What happens when we as women become depressed, right? We, we probably don't clean our houses and we don't take care of things mm -hmm. or it's a struggle just to get the other kids up and take them to school. So right there, I just gave you some examples of things that you can do. Hey, listen, let me pick up the kids uh, this right. week and take them to school and pick them up. Or if one of your kids gets sick, let me take them to the pediatrician for you. You know, can you grant me pr mm -hmm. permission at the doctor to, to take your child for you? Bring over dinner. You know, somebody said one time, I don't know what to do. So I just made them a casserole. Are you kidding me? That's wonderful. Because the last thing that we want to do is cook, but we also have family to take care of. And so just bringing over dinner where we can go and just basically sit in our sadness, <laughs> however our family is fed, does wonders. So there are things that you can do other than just say, what can I do? Because I will tell you, Kanisha, when someone came to me, when Bryant died, so just let me know if there's anything I can do to help you. I couldn't even have a rational thought. There's no way I'm going to be able to tell you what you can do to help me. Because we're not thinking of that. We're, we're in our, we're in our grief and our pain in those moments. And so I don't know, you know, what you right. can do. <laughs> you tell me what you can do because I, I have know. no idea what to tell you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So you wrote, you wrote the book, um, Once Upon a Child. And that was, was that initially when you were telling your story after you had your miscarriage? That was, that happened after the birth of my son. Okay. I decided to write it then because it wasn't just after I had mine, but I noticed in the community where I was, I started seeing friends that suffered with them too. I mean, I sat with a good friend of mine from church that had, I think, three ecoptic pregnancies during that time. Wow. And those are miscarriages as well, but painful and a, a completely different process and I remember bless her heart she just she desired children so badly that they had a room in their house reserved for their baby and just kept losing their baby due to this um, issue that she was having and I was devastated for her but we were there and we served their family we sat with them and we were you know in her and then several others that I knew too in my community. I'm like, why does this keep happening? So I wanted to do a little bit of research and, and they were all coming to me almost as if I was the 
source here, you know, of mm -hmm. this issue. And maybe because out of the group, I was the first one that had walked through it, but they would often, what do I do with this? Or Kenesha, what's going to happen? Or what could happen? Or what, what happened to you? So they were asking me personally, you know, like, well, when you went through it, what did what happened here? What did they feel like? Mm -hmm. What did your doctor's appointment go through? When did your body get back to normal? When did you start trying for another baby, right? So I had those two losses, but then I also struggled with, I think we did infertility, uh, not treatments, but I struggled with getting pregnant for a couple of years before I had my son. So then when I finally had him, of course, I was just floored out of my mind that, you know, it happened, you know, for me. I'm so grateful, but my heart still lingered in that community because while I had my baby, I also knew friends that were still struggling with this right. too. So I said, I'm just going to share my story. And I hope that it brings help, r relief, just maybe a little bit in finding that you're not by yourself walking through this experience that so many women have, been, it happens to them as well. I had a friend not long ago, um, have a miscarriage her and her husband for like maybe the third time and she texted me and said I need your book where can I get your book and she said because I don't I'm not finding anything else that's really helping me and so I that same day hopped in my car and brought her a copy of my book I drove it over there I said here this is for you I said, please, I'm here for you. Please let me know. I, you know, and again, it's, it's so hard to like, what can I do? But it's like, right. it, it's, that's such a tough place to be in because I'm like, I can bring lunch. I can, here's, here's my book. I can sit and listen. I'm available to talk when you're ready. You know, just those types of things. And she was so grateful. She read it. And then she came back and said, it was everything I needed to read, you know, right. and it blessed my heart to know that my story helped her in some kind of way so you know i think that's wonderful because i think god actually chooses those soldiers right in his army that are going to he's going to empower us to be resilient and yes. strong and sometimes you know i know that you and you probably feel the same way you look back and you say okay god i don't want to be the soldier i don't want to be strong please don't give me anything else you know but he trusts those soldiers in his Christian army to be resilient and he gives you the strength where you feel that you lack in order to be a blessing and a servant and an educator and a nurturer and a spiritual soul sister to someone that is going through exactly the same thing that you may be going through whether it's loss whether it's, and because grief is a lot of different things, right? So you could be grieving over um, a divorce. So you've lost your spouse. It can be a loss of a parent mm -hmm. by death. It could be a loss in a relationship from a strange relationship with your mother or your sister. And there's, or you could lose your business. There's a lot of reasons why we grieve. And grief is that of loss, not necessarily that by death. And so mm -hmm. I think he puts people in place in order to have them be resilient to do those things that he needs you to do. So we're basically a vessel and a messenger and a nurturer for Christ. And I believe that we are selected. There are people that are selected. You may not want to be selected. <laughs> you know, if, if I could go back, I mean, please don't select me. Just let me go back to my life when I had my Bryant with me. Right. But in, I, I can't do that. So it's like taking what, life has given you the cards that you have been dealt and being able to trust that there is a purpose behind this pain and enabling you to be there for someone else. And that's what you do. So you can know that God has blessed you. He has blessed you because he trusts you in order to help all of those other women that have gone through those miscarriages. And it doesn't mean that you're completely healed. We don't have to be strong and completely healed because I will never be healed over the loss of my son. I, you can label me as a grieved mom. You can label me as the mother that lost the child. It doesn't matter what you label me because my perception of me is what God says, right? Not what people say, right. but you, exactly. can, you can be labeled in however you want, but the truth be told, you are a resilient, strong woman that has been put in place for a purpose. 
and we're going to have our days. I call them my Bryant days. We are still going to be resilient because God gives us that strength because he trusts us. He trusts yes. that we're going to share our story and we're going to help other women. And that's exactly what you've done. But there's something else that you've done. And you wrote another book to help yes. women be able to share their story. So tell us a little bit about that. Put Your Pen to Paper is a book that released this year also. And I created that resource uh, just for that very purpose, like you said, it's to help others uh, take their stories and uh, share them in book form. Um, I have been in the writing and book publishing industry for well over a decade. I think I started getting into writing more professionally, kind of took it more serious than a hobby. I think right around the time my son was born, I decided to, okay, you know, I love writing. I really have a desire to inspire and encourage others with, with word and more importantly, my mission, I've always kind of seen myself as a missional writer. So I love everything you're telling me right now. It's just <laughs> on point with exactly what the Lord had shown me over the years as well. Um, I've always kind of seen myself as that missional writer. So my desire has been to inspire and encourage people in the Lord first um, within those various topics, right? That I write about through stories, through fiction, nonfiction. But I decided to create this resource because a lot of people have been asking me how uh, to do it. And um, a big part of my journey, I'm going to back up a little bit. A big part of my journey is also that I had, um, for about eight years, ran a small press publishing company and published a little bit over 200 books with different authors. So I've got, got a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with a lot of authors. And my authors mostly wrote Christian-based books. So I had lots of devotionals. I did get a lot of personal stories too. So lots of memoirs. And um, let me see, I would, you know, like a Bible study or study series, you know, prayer journal, things like that. Um, and then a lot of children's books. I also worked with a lot of children's book authors too. <laughs> so that, those are tons of fun, of course, to work with. But I always had a desire to help writers. And this book was, was practically a lot of the things I've learned um, when I was into publishing and I just put it here just to motivate and encourage writers that they can do it. Um, Cause I also, I do coaching as well uh, with writers and help them to walk through their writing process and, Oh, they're met with so much in that, in that season, right. In that process, it's, you're met with a lot of self doubt, discouragement. Can I do this? Should I do this? Should I say this? Who's going to read my book? You know, I don't know, you know, how I'm going to do this, right? So I have to coach them through that process, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but the book is there, you know, as a resource to help them motivate them through it, you know, that they can do it and that God's with them. So that's wonderful yeah. because I think too, a book is such it, it, it's a huge credibility business card, right? It's a business card that gives you credibility behind what you're already telling in the first place, because we all have a story. We all have a story. And I have talked to so many women that said, you know, my wife, my life is pretty dull and you know, I don't really have any special skills and I don't really have anything to write about because I have a course called, uh, uh, the roadmap, master roadmap and to writing and women say, well, I don't have anything to write about because I don't have anything exciting. I don't really have a talent. And then come to find out she's a master chef or something. And I'm like, really? Like, why do you not think that you have any skills? Well, because it comes easy. If it comes easy to that person, they don't look at it as a skill. And then you find out that they've been through three and four foster care homes and wow. now they've come out on the other side and they foster children. And then they tell me they don't have a story to tell. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Like, do you have any idea what story that is that you could actually tell? So I think that's beautiful that you coach women and you help them tell their story because I wish that I had had that back in 2014. Yeah. I did not have that. I did have a publisher, um, but I basically just told my story for seven years. I just wrote in a journal because I had no other way to deal with my pain. And so I really <laughs> preach about journaling. And um, that's why I came out with the workbook, Create Your Life, because not only is it a devotional, but it gives you the ability to journal. And I think when you can't 
put out there um, without feeling like that you're burdening someone or you have pain, you have to get it out. You know, like you being in the publishing uh, industry and an editor yourself, you understand what writers go through and you understand writer's block. And so what are some tips? Tell us a little bit about the book and what are some tips that we can do if we do, maybe we don't feel like we have a story. How do you dig down to find out what you can write about if you feel like you don't have the story? Start writing. You can tell your story, you know, remember, you know, it's okay to recall those hard times. And sometimes I would work with writers that would say, Hey, I have been through such a horrible, awful thing, you know, in my life. And like I was kidnapped and, and tortured. And, you know, this, this is just an, um, an example. And so I've been through that. So how do I say that? How do I write that? Like, what do I do with that? And as we go through that process, I always said, you know, one thing you have to remember is that you made it. Okay. You're, you're telling your story, you're reflecting on the things that happened, but you made it, you know, God helped you out of that. And that's the thing that helps you kind of motivate you to go back and those, those hard parts down. Look, I remember talking to writers and we're both in tears on the phone, just thinking about their past and it's hurtful to remember. Yeah. And you, you, you could be triggered easily too. And Sometimes we have to take a, a minute, you know, a break, a quick break. Keep in mind, you made it, you know, you made it right. through, you know, or you've had progression through it, you know, and just right. like you're saying, you know, about your son, it's not ever a hundred percent. I mean, I always still have those triggers and things like that as well. I mean, it's a part of our story that God allowed for his purposes, right? I mean, just think of how far you come you know and that's what i encourage writers you know to do too so one by one just you know kind of write down those little small things that you want to cover and just take your time you right. know and then the other thing you don't have to rush through it take your time you know <laughs> lots of writers feel that they have to hurry up and write 1500 words a day and that they have to write it in a month you know, for it to be done and quickly tell their story that way. And no, you don't have to do it that way. You can right. pace yourself and take your time. Right. You know, and this is right. your book. So you can say whatever you want. You can leave out if you want to. It's completely up to you. But just as long as you write, you take your time and go at your own pace. You know, that's right. a couple of things I can think of from the book. <laughs> right. And you know, too, I've, I've known people that have a story to tell and they're embarrassed by what this happened to them in their life. And still I encourage them to get it out because, you know, in actuality, you can publish a book and not put your true name on a book. Now you're not going to be able to market that book if you don't put your name on the book. However, if it's just something that you want to get out there in hopes that it reaches someone and can help, you don't have to put your name on the book. You can use, I know there's many authors that use a different name to publish books and you don't even yeah. know. There's people that put their names on books that didn't actually write them. They have ghostwriters that write those books for them and they may use somebody famous to put, you know, their name on the actual book when in actuality it wasn't even them that wrote the book. Um, I don't know that I'm an advocate for that. I believe if you have a story to tell, um, you need to tell the story. And if you feel like you want to get it out there and you want to just use a pen name, um, yeah. you can do that too. Because I know that there are issues. I know people that have had issues with sexual abuse that may have taken place within the family and they yeah, don't yeah. want to expose um, their sure. family or themselves mm -hmm. to that embarrassment as well. But you can mm -hmm. still journal it and you can still you can still get it out, right? And it takes yes. bravery, I tell you. Every yes. single time I talk to an author that has a story like that to tell um, a trauma to victory sort of story, it's it's always, it's it takes such bravery and courage, you know? And sometimes we've got to muster up that courage. And a lot of times we have to pray and ask the Lord to give us the strength to say it you know, mm -hmm. to help us with it, you know, and it's okay because it's hard. It's really hard, but it's okay. And you can do it. And lots of people do it. And one, one other thing that I'd like to encourage my writers to keep in mind is think of 
the people you're going to reach as you're writing it. Think of them. Um, that has to be one of the reasons, you know, that you're doing this, you know, besides the personal release, right, that you'll feel because it's like journaling, you know, except you're putting it in your book form. But think of the people that you're writing it for, you know, who's that person that you're wanting to reach with it, right? Who's that other young lady that's been through what you've been through, you know, that need to hear your story, you know? And once we keep that as like a top priority as we're writing, then it'll help that process too a lot more because you're sort of kind of taking the focus off of your own pain, but thinking of how this is going to help somebody else. You know, which absolutely would even when it's hard to do it, you know. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So tell everybody, thank you so much, Kanisha. You've been a blessing on the show today. Tell everyone where we can get your book and where we can find you. Oh, well, thank nice. you so much. And um, I have my books and everything on my website, KanishaGriffin.com. Um, for writers that are interested in, in my coaching program on my Instagram page there's a page called create and blossom LLC and that's where I post a lot of um, inspirational tips um, and motivation and you know just really good posts for writers you know they're interested in, um, in needing some guidance so um, that's where I can be found online so Instagram it is at Kanisha Griffin and it's um, at create and blossom LLC and on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, you can reach me at Kenesha the Writer. So I have a, an author and speaker page that's specific to my books and my writing, and you can find me on that one there. Great. And so, and your book is entitled "Put Your Pen to Paper." Thank you so much, Kenesha. I appreciate you very much. I really, really do. Thank you, Sharice. It's been now, so much fun. And guys, remember, step out of your comfort zone. If you have a story to tell, start writing. Just start writing. Put that pen to paper, just like Kanisha's book says, and just start getting it out there. And I'm telling you, it will begin to blossom. And if you need help with that, you can always reach out to Kanisha. She can help you with that, but get your story out there. You may be stepping out of your comfort zone, but nothing happens wonderful in that comfort zone. You have to step out, step out in faith, and always remember to keep your faith in God. He's going to guide you. And until next week, I'll be praying for you. The loss of a loved one is a nearly universal emotional crisis. Unprocessed grief and painful feelings can be buried, leaving you to feel numb. But there is hope. Certified grief counselor, RN, and author Sherry Ricard shares her story of how to cope in her first book, Wake Up Call, A Mother's Grief Journey, after the loss of her 17-year-old son. This book, along with Sherry's other books, are available on Amazon as well as on SherryRicard.com.